Team, happy Monday and welcome to another show within the funnel. And as you know, the objective of all of these podcasts and LinkedIn Live webinars, we're trying to share some strategies and processes and tools that you can use to apply to you and your business today to make yourselves better in professional sales. And boy, team, what a treat we have today. Today, we've got one of the top sales thought leaders in the entire world joining us. We've got Tony J. Hughes. And Tony is an author, a keynote speaker. He's a consultant and sales trainer. He's also an educator. He actually teaches sales, modern selling in the MBA school at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. But he is one of sales, uh, the thought leaders in all of the entire world in professional sales. So um, on his blogs, he's actually been rated the number one blogger for professional sales content by Top Sales Magazine and by Best Sales Blogger. LinkedIn has rated Tony one of the top three influencers in professional sales globally. And his content is actually viewed by more people in LinkedIn than anybody else. Think of that for a second. He's got 500,000 people following the blogs here today. Now, he's, um, he's got a career in sales that really mirrors what we all wish we'd had. Started as a direct contributor, went into being a sales leader, ended up running technology companies, certainly being the, the head of the global Asia Pacific region for multinationals. So he's done it all. He's run technology companies and startups. He's seen it all. And the reason we're so excited to, amongst all of those things, if you add to that, he's actually an Amazon best-selling author on a couple of different fronts. His first book, very close to our heart, The Joshua Principle, talking about big deals. Okay, that's where we came from. And I love that topic. He then kind of pivoted when the market was saying, hey, they need more help in terms of filling the top of the funnel. And many of you, I'm sure, have read his spectacular book, Combo Prospecting. So this is actually in its 10th printing. Think of that. It's in its 10th printing. And then finally, with his teammate, um, Justin Michael, they've released in 2021 this book, Tech-Powered Sales, that you need to buy and read immediately. So this book I'm holding right now, Top Sales Magazine, has, has put it on a list to identify it as the top sales book of the year. Um, those of you who follow other folks like Victor Antonio, he's calling it the sales book of the decade. Um, I absolutely love this book. And most of you follow the podcasts, follow the webinars. You know how I read books. I wipe, you know, I do my highlighting. I take notes. You'll keep going back to this book time and time again. There's a few things that I think are really important about this book. First of all, the timing. So, so, of course, we're all leveraging the tech stack. It's exploding, um, you know, kind of 500 platforms today that could increase tenfold over the next year, year. So we all need to be leveraging technology to enable a better future for us. But the other thing I really love about this book team is it's not just about technology. There's a, there's a very clear identification of what we need to do as professional salespeople to be effective. Technology might trigger and help us have more conversations, but in those conversations, we need to do the things that we can do very well as salespeople and that no technology is going to be able to replace, whether it's, you know, engaging in meaningful discovery, whether it's helping our clients and prospects build better business cases that are more compelling for what we do, or even if it's trying to figure out how to navigate these complex sales cycles with lots of different buyers so we can work with them to get consensus on decisions. The end of this book, by the way, and we're going to talk to Tony about it, they make some very bold predictions. So what's going to happen with professional sales in the future? And one of those predictions is there'll be far fewer professional salespeople because companies are investing in the tech stack. So today, you know, high growth companies might spend as much as $1,000 per rep per month. Yes, you heard me correctly, per rep per month on the tech stack, that could increase fivefold over the coming years. And so uh, the reason I, another reason I love the book, we get some counsel from Tony and from Justin that as professional salespeople, we need to 
future proof our careers by being capable with technology. This is not something that we can absolve ourselves from. So this is a book team that we need to go out and buy today. We need to start reading through it and taking ownership for our growth in this space because it's not going away. Technology is gonna enable our future. But without further ado, let me stop talking and let me introduce you to jo Tony J. Hughes. We'll give him a great digital welcome here today, all the way from Sydney, Australia and the future. Tony's, it's Tuesday for Tony. And we're recording this on a Monday afternoon. Tony, welcome. Hey, Mark. Thank you for having me on, uh, buddy. It seems like it's going to be all downhill after an introduction like that. I'm really excited. You know, I am so certain that's not going to be the case, Tony. One of the pleasures about doing these, these podcasts, it's the research I get to do on folks. And I, I've heard you on so many different podcasts. You're absolutely spectacular. So hopefully I don't mess anything up because we've already seen that you've actually succeeded at these. Listen, no, sure this is going to be great. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, Tony, you know, let's start with the way, way we like to start with a lot of guests. Talk us through your journey in professional sales, kind of getting you to where you are today. How did you grow through that path? Well, Mark, a lot of the audience today are really, really business leaders. So, so the people that are the CEO uh, and the people that lead the sales organization. Uh, and for me, I started my business life really young. Uh, I went, I, I left the bank, which was where I really started my career initially. And my father rescued me from the bank. <laughs> and he asked, he, he asked me to come and work for him. He ran a manufacturing business, hydraulic engineering manufacturing business. Terrific. I work for him and, uh, and I love my dad dearly. He's since passed away, but my, my dad was Mensa level genius, but also bipolar and also an alcoholic. So man, man, that was a wild, wild ride. And um, I ended up, end up taking over the company and we manufactured construction equipment. So, so, so heavy industry. Um, we, we built a product that we got 90, 95% market share in Australia. Holy um, smokes. Yeah, so these, these were very innovative hydraulic buckets uh, for skid steer loaders, earth moving equipment. Anyway, we sold the company in Australia and I went to America to conquer the, 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 the USA and Canada. Um, and instead of doing that, I, I lost a fair amount of money and learned a lot. Um, but I got a phone call on my 25th birthday. So I was young. I got a phone call on my 25th birthday in Los Angeles from my stepdad uh, and to, to let me know that my mother had liver cancer. Oh, so nice. I ended up flying back home uh, and within, within three, four months, my mother had died. We'd nursed her at home. She was only 43, if you can believe this, really oh, young. Goodness. So but sorry. in a seven week, but, but, and the reason, the, the reason for the story is you're going to think, my God, this is the craziest way to ever decide to get into sales. So came back to Australia. My, my mom passed away. Uh, and, you know, we all say that, you know, things can't get worse or bad things come in threes. I need to tell you that's not true. So on a seven week period, um, my, my mother died. My stepdad killed the guy that was at, a, was at the funeral. Um, he went out for a social gathering, got into a fight with him, put him in a headlock and, and the guy died. Holy my, sister, my sister tried to commit suicide. The fa my car got stolen. The family dog got run over. Uh, my wife left me uh, we, and we lost our business in America. My two biggest customers, a company called Owatonna Manufacturing Corporation up in Minnesota. They'd been in business for more than 100 years. Uh, they declared chap Chapter 11. Um, and the joint venture manufacturing partner we had out of California declared bankruptcy as well. So wow. it's like everything that could go wrong that went wrong. And I decided, look, I needed to stay in Sydney with what was happening in my family life. But I, I was prevented from going back into the industry because we were getting royalties for 12 years. Right. So I thought, you know what? I, I don't know what I want to do in business next, but I need to learn how to sell. That was my big epiphany in li living and working in the USA in business. I need to learn how to sell. So I got a job in sales. I was terrible at the beginning, but I had a great uh, sales manager who did ride-alongs with me once a week and coached me. Uh, I became the most successful person in that industry. The records have never been broken. Um, sold, for example, to IBM at 70 percent higher prices than they were paying the competition they're still a customer today two and a half nearly three decades later i know that sounds crazy for this company um and i ended up just falling in love with selling um and i kept getting lured into management roles and i ended up running the asia pacific region for north american multinationals 
Well, well, first of all, what an amazing story that kind of takes my breath away. So, so you start yeah. to think about resilience and perseverance and all those things. And boy, um, who among us hasn't had a tough time? And it's amazing to me, Tony, the number of enormously successful people like yourself that I get the privilege of interviewing who've had a unique journey to get there. And it's never the smooth sailing. So hopefully that provides a little bit of um, wind in the sails for, for anybody watching this now or in the future when things are getting a little tight and tough that the perseverance helps us get through because you know now you're one of the top global thought leaders on this topic of professional sales. Now yeah. on, that, you know, on that topic, Tony, I'll say one of the things that hit me so hard was um, at the beginning of Tech Powered Sales, you know, we know in this podcast has referenced the fact that professional sales is not as professional as it needs to be. And most of the, the indicators that would, would be triggers to, for us to understand how well we're doing, you know, number of uh, reps hitting quota, number of folks, you know, staying or churning in jobs on an annual basis, a uh, number of decisions that are going to no decision because nobody's providing compelling value. And then, and then finally, you know, some of the Gardner research that talks about them just not getting value out of salespeople. Clearly, there's a difficult state in the industry, but you spell it out at the, the start of this book even, e e even more directly. Tell me about your view with your, you know, with your context on the state of professional sales today. Professional selling is in deep trouble, um, and most people are just living in denial. One of the bold predictions that Justin, uh, Justin Michael and I make in the book is that in this decade, about one third of field B2B sellers are going to disappear. Wow. Uh, and the reality is every seller, every business, in fact, but every seller especially needs to generate the level of value that funds them in their role. Um, and Mark, let me, let me tell you a true story. Uh, I was working with a, a room of CEOs in Australia um, about uh, seven months ago, it was before our last lockdown okay. uh, here, here in Sydney. And I was just talking about the things we'll discuss today. And in the break, one of the CEOs came to talk to me about one of the points I raised with fewer field salespeople. And, and I won't say the name of the company, but he said, let me tell you what's happened in, in his company. He's a global organization. He runs the Australia, New Zealand region. He has three field reps in Australia. In North America, when COVID hit last year, they lost two of their reps, the, just through natural attrition, they just resigned. So two of their reps left two of the biggest territories in the USA. They were looking in their CRM system about four months later because they hadn't managed to backfill those roles because of COVID, it was too difficult. Oh, four months God. later, they, they look in their CRM system at their reporting. These two territories have grown sales as strongly as any other territory in the market. But here was the amazing thing. Much higher margins, the most profitable territories in the entire company. So they go, what the hell is going on? So they go and interview the, the clients. Now, this company provides compounding substances for pharmacists in drugstores okay. that, that make ointments and medicines, right? So they, they, they supplied the pharmacy market, the drugstore market. They went and saw the customers. They talked to them, they interviewed them on Zoom calls. And they said, hey, we're so sorry we haven't been able to replace your rep. You know, we really believe in making that investment. You're important to us. The relationship matters. Um, you know, would you mind giving some feedback? We've noticed you've been transacting really strongly with this, despite the fact we lost the rep. Here's what they discovered. I'll give you the punchline. <laughs> the customer said, well, look, we don't really value your reps that much at all. When they come and visit us, they take us away from revenue generating customer facing activity. They don't really provide us any new information. We received that from emails from you in the newsletters and the product updates and then technical bulletins. So, you know, we, we don't really mind that you don't have any reps. It actually gives us back some time. And the company said, you, but you're kidding me. These cost a lot of money. Surely they provide, you know, value for you. And they said, well, actually, yes, there's one thing. There's one thing. They give us a discount. <laughs> I thought that was coming. I thought yeah. that was coming. There's one thing. They, they give us a discount. So here's what this company decided to do. They thought, let's run an experiment, not in North America, which is a, a massive key homeland market. They said, let's find a representative market and run an experiment. They picked Australia. Okay. 
they they got rid of the three reps in this region. The business has never been more profitable and successful. Wow. And what they did is they took that money they were paying field sellers and they invested it in upskilling, in essence, their inside sellers. These are the technical support people. If the pharmacist has a question or a problem or a concern, they call into this helpline or they do Zoom calls. So they, ups, they upskilled those people and they improved their, their marketing communications, but the business is going to be stronger. Now, will it stay that way forever? Will they end up deciding we're going to lose market share because competitors are out there visiting? But today, the people that we want to get to to drive sales increasingly are not lonely and bored and looking for another friend in their business life. Right. And they just, they just don't see the value in some seller that's interrupting their day. Well, you know, Tony, by the way, what a, what a punchline. Isn't that the most, yeah, we miss the salesperson because they're, we're not getting the discounts that they would offer at the end of the quarter to try and jam something through. I'll, I'll tell you, we'll talk in a minute about the skills that are so required, but one of the things that, that you know, we've been so blessed to have an opportunity to work with a lot of very large manufacturing companies or services businesses with massive sales force. Many of us are, are on the call here today. And when we start to think about those things that we think are so important for a professional seller today, meaning understanding the environment and the world of the person you are selling to so you can add value about helping them run a better business or get to a better future, I'll tell you, there's a lot of traditional industries where, you know, those manufacturing salespeople, they may not be as tight on the technology as some of the younger generations, but they absolutely know the industry that they're selling to. And they absolutely understand the key metrics and the way those people are measured. So when they put a business case together, it goes through. Their close yes. rates tend to be high on, on qualified deals because they understand how they run the business. And they understand that the solution provides a compelling outcome or growth in terms of revenue or reduction of expense or risk. So, so, you know, I find a lot of times in today's world in professional selling, some of these more traditional industries, they might be looked down on as being a little bit of old school, but being able to understand the environment of your client or your prospect isn't old school. It needs to, we need back to the future with a lot of these these tech companies and the reps that are reaching out um, today because they understand technology, but they actually don't understand how to sell for logical and good reasons, in many cases, the volume. But before, Tony, we jump into what a story in terms of, boy, the, the profitability rose. Before we kind of jump into that and, and jump into the tech side, which is so well put together in the book with you and Justin. By the way, I think Justin's going to be joining us on the show in a, a few weeks' yes. time. So yes. we'll look forward to having him there too. But um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, your view on the core playbook for, for a salesperson. I think you lay it out beautifully in the book. I've heard you lay this out before. But if I'm in professional sales today, without getting into the technology yet, what do I need to be good at as a professional salesperson to kind of future-proof my career? Well, Mark, you and I are completely aligned, and I loved everything that you just said. So, oh, before we you. jump, before we jump into the tech, let me just reinforce how what you said is so true. This is the first big key takeaway for everybody here today. The job of a great seller is to help the customer make the right comparisons. Because what typically happens is the customer is busy if they're out evaluating the market, wanting to compare us with our competition. You know, do, do you offer this, that, and the other thing? What are the features, the functions, the specifications, the attributes, the service levels, the price? So they're trying to compare us with others. Our job as a seller is to help them make the right comparison. So we need to help the customer to think about the cost of inaction, right? So the cost of staying in current okay. state and the prize of a better future state compared with working with us. And in essence, we want to build conversations around the business case for change. And Mark, that was exactly what you just described. Unless we understand the buyer in their role within their company, in their industry, then we have no chance of building a point of view that earns engagement. So all sellers need to understand the industry which, which they're targeting and then their ideal customer profile and then those buyer personas that they sell to. So if, for example, you're selling to the, to the CFO um, in, in heavy industrial manufacturing, we need to know, great, well, how is a CFO in a big manufacturing business measured? 
right? How does the CEO hold them to account? And we need to build conversation around how that CFO can drive improved results in their role. And then what we're doing is we're creating a, com a comparison within action and we're helping them build the business case for change. Because Mark, you're dead right. The biggest thing we're competing in, uh, we're competing against, sorry, is inaction or status quo. Yeah. So unless there's compelling commercial value, the danger is there'll be lots of interest that consumes a lot of our time and resources, but there's no purchase at the end of it. So it's really important we lead with the, the commercial value of change, and then we speak to both head and heart. Oh, fantastic. People make decisions. We always try and use this term to simplify saying, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of decisions do get made through Excel. So there's got to be that financial business case if we want to make sure it's compelling. And even in many cases, coaching the teams of buyers on how they position this internally or coaching them on in terms of getting consensus around that business case to make sure it stays front of mind so we get that decision done. So, yeah. so let's continue on that, Tony, before we jump in, because once we get into the tech, it's going to be pretty exciting here, but let's keep, keep talking a little bit about those skills and capabilities as professional salespeople today. And then because of the audience, I think we're going to talk a little bit about sales management and team, by the way, just a reminder, my mistake, I'd like to remind everybody on today, um, please chat your questions to us. So my amazing teammates, Neil and Sandra, will be catch capturing your questions and then feeding them to us in a few minutes time. So please, now that we've got Tony here, please fire your questions away when, you know, as we go through this, we'll make sure we make some time for some real interaction there. But, but once we understand, you know, some of the things that we want to do as professional salespeople, Tony, so, okay, I've got, I've got my product market focus mapped out. I think I've got the personas. Hopefully the company and the team have helped me with that. You know, I think I've refined some of my skill set in terms of trying to engage, you know, in meaningful conversation and effective discovery can always be improved, by the way, including yours truly here. But if I think I've got my discovery, I've got some form of maybe a methodology for assessing how I'm doing strategically against all the buyers to try and get consensus. What are the other things that we have to contemplate as sellers to be successful in our territories today, to take ownership um, you know, of our patch, if you will, or our territory to make yeah. sure we're successful? So, so the first thing is based on being honest about product market fit, define your ideal customer profile. The whole world is not a prospect, so we need to do that. Next thing, understand the personas we sell to, these buyer personas, how they measured in their role, what the typical objections will be, what the trigger events are that occur in their world, uh, how, how, how they're influenced. The third thing is, based on knowing our ICP and buyer personas, we need to nail our narrative. We need to create a worthwhile point of view on how that person can drive improved results in their role. If we, if we do the opposite of that, which is what most people do, and talk about us and what we do, <laughs> if we talk about us and what we do, what we do is we create comparison with competition, questions about price, and we get delegated away, right? So we need a worthwhile point of view. Now, let me just give you a real world example of this. One of my biggest clients I work with globally is a global travel management company. So they really? work with very big corporates to manage their travel programs. And their leadership team called me when the pandemic hit because when COVID first hit, airlines stopped flying, business travel was just killed. So they rang me and said, all of our sellers and our account managers are getting the same universal pushback from customers and prospects who say, hey, look, I don't even know why you're calling. None of my staff are traveling. Phone me back when the airlines are in the air again. Mm -hmm. And I said, we need to make that excuse for not wanting to talk to us the reason they should. So here's the narrative we created. They called the CFO of a big corporate or a big government department, and they'd say, hey, Mary, with none of your staff traveling right now. Now, that phrase straight away stops that objection coming up because that's the mm -hmm. reason you're calling. Hey, Mary, with none of your staff traveling right now, there's an opportunity for you to drive 8 to 12% of cost out of what will return to be the third to fifth biggest expense line item on your PL. And with no one traveling, you don't have any change management issues and you've got the bandwidth in your admin team. Wow. Do you mind if I ask? 
did, did, did you mind if I ask, when's the last time you reviewed your travel policy and the way you run it as a process? Oh. Now, what, what, what that does is it gets the customer focused on the fact that I, as the CFO, can drive 8 to 12% of cost out of the third biggest expense line item on my PL, and things will return to normal at some stage. It's going to return to being there. Yes, the inmates do run the asylum when it comes to travel inside our organization. They don't follow policy. They use their own personal cards. They stay at their favorite hotels and use their favorite airlines that maximize mm -hmm. their points for their free holiday with their family at the end of the year. Sure they do. don't put expenses in for five months and then dump a big one in and it causes travel freezes. And then we lose a deal because we couldn't fly over to do the demo. So, you know, this resonates for the person. Right, uh, but what you're doing is is you're getting the customer to identify the real costs in travel that can be saved, which is poor policy and poor process. Mm. Lazy customers want to focus on the travel provider and say, "What's your booking fee?" Right, you know, have you got a cheaper booking fee? Well, that's just fiddling around the edges with cost. So we want to create the right comparison. So it just goes to this third thing: nail your narrative. Right, create the right conversation narrative. Right, and which gets them focused on the business case for change because there's three reasons the deal slips, stall, and die. Hmm. The number one is lack of compelling commercial value. You, you nailed that, um, you know, Mark, when we were talking. The second reason is a lack of consensus in their team. So we need to cover all of those people that form consensus for change. And the third reason is just something nasty happens, they get acquired <laughs> as the quarter leaves. But you can help mitigate the risk of the third thing by nailing the first two. If they're motivated by the commercial value of change, but they want to get this done, they're thinking every month we stay in current state, look at the risk, look at the cost. We have to get on with that. I uh, have to get on with this. And if they've got consensus in their team, and then if we truly understand their process, you know, in, in how we, we make sure we're trying to drive our deal, um, you know, then, then, then we're going to be okay. So nail your narrative, get them focused on the business case, right? That, that's really the key thing. And then, the fourth thing we need to do in this process, so ICP, buy personas, nail our narrative. The next thing is find ways to break through to people. Most sellers in our organizations are doing just enough to not feel guilty rather than what it actually takes to be successful. And buyers today are being bombarded, blasted by a white wall you know, of noise from sales and marketing machines, and it's getting worse. Yep. The, the automation through tech stacks of sales attempts are doing much more damage than they are good for, for people's brand and for results. So we need to we need to pattern interrupt with a high level of personalization to be relevant to people uh, if, if we're going to sell successfully. Well, well, there's so many great things there, team. And by the way, we're going to summarize those three reasons that deals die. When we do our summary note today, you should be sending that to your entire organization and that should be on their wall. So we don't have compelling, um, Tony used the term commercial business case. It's not a compelling business case, commercial business case. We don't have consensus amongst the buying team. And then the third, something bad happens. Yeah. Some, you know, sometimes that's, that, that's outside of our control, but, but this is why we always say deal, uh, time kills deals. The chance of something bad happens long, you know, the more that the, the deal drags out, that the higher propensity is something can surprise me here. But, but if we circle back, there's just so much gold there today. This, this thought about just doing enough not to feel guilty. And, and sorry, before I jump there, I just want to grab this other point that's so important. That narrative that you just shared for the travel company, um, I think the vast majority of us, including me, would have thought travel company in the middle of COVID, okay, most of that company that you were working with, their competitors weren't reaching out to anybody. They, their salespeople had tools down for the balance of COVID because they didn't have that narrative. Given that narrative, when you arm your team with that narrative, they couldn't wait to reach out to everybody. And this, I think sales leaders and sales managers and boy, do I ever have an empathetic heart toward the sales leaders out there in terms of how busy we all are. But this is where you actually add value. It's not counting what somebody did two weeks ago. It doesn't matter. Help them influence the behavior in the future. 
And that kind of narrative would just trigger so many companies that we worked, we were lucky enough to work with. They were super engaged during the start of COVID. When everybody put their tools down, they were reaching out and said, I just want to, I've got a point of view as to how we can help. And I want to understand how you're doing, because we've got a couple of different ways we've been helping folks in your situation right now. They reached out to help with no immediate expectation of commerce and amazing things happened. But people, people took those calls because they knew we could add value or these companies could add value. Oh, what a fantastic conversation, Tony, and thank you. So let's now, as we migrate over into technology, you've mapped out the things that we need to be good at as professional salespeople, and we need to build those playbooks. At the highest level, what can we leverage technology for? Before we get into the specifics, what's technology doing at the highest level for us today? Well, te technology pervades everything. And um, just for those watching this and listening to this, um, imagine if you were walking down the aero bridge at an airport to, 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 to board a flight. And as you reach the threshold of the aircraft <laughs> to sort of step on, the, um, the, the air crew member there is asking for your boarding pass to, to have a look and show you to your seat or point you to walk down the aisle. And you look to your left and you can see into the cockpit with the, with the two pilots there. And you overhear one of the pilots say to the other, hey, I really love flying, but I'm just not into the tech. You know, how, how, would, how, would, how would you feel? Like you'd think, Man, I, I need to turn around and get off. And yet, and yet so many sellers have this mindset, you know, hey, I, I really love selling. I'm great with relationships. Um, you know, I take the time to understand my customer, but I'm, I'm, I'm just not into all of the tech. Well, every white collar profession in the world yeah. is being augmented and ultimately disrupted by technology. If you, if you look at, 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 for example, law, there's plenty of roles in, in the legal professions that are just disappearing. You know, the whole thing of, hey, I'm really good at doing research and precedent, you know, to decide whether an employer should pursue a case against an employee or try and defend the litigation rather than settle. You know, I'll, I'll go and look at precedent. Well, there's tech that just goes and answers that question far better than humans, you know, as, as far as the probability goes. If you look at mergers and acquisitions, all the due diligence around all of the contracts and where the contingent liabilities are and inconsistencies. Tech does all of that. So whether it's medicine, uh, law, aviation, even in the military, you know, the, the, the military is replacing people with technology at phenomenal rates. Mm. Um, I, I don't know whether people know this, and I, I, I give the example in the book, but DARPA is the, is the, the military spook agency in the USA. Um, they've got an AI fighter pilot that last year they put up against a real fighter pilot and they even detuned the AI fighter pilot to fly way within human limits, way within human mm. limits, and it beat the real pilot five zip. And the reality is there's only so hard that a human being can pull on the joystick. I'm really looking forward to the new Top Gun Maverick movie. Yeah. But there's only, there's, only, there's only so hard that a human can pull on the joystick before they pass out. An AI yeah. fighter pilot can fly within the limits of the airframe rather than the limits of the G-forces of a human. So a human's never going to, never going to win that. So for all sellers, we need to think, how can I outsource tasks within my role to technology that technology does phenomenally well and better than me so that I can focus on the true, the true human elements of selling. And it's really, really important. And those who fail to embrace technology are doomed to be replaced by it. Mm -hmm. right? So when you think my job is to provide the value that funds my role, and if you go, well, the value is relationships. Well, not enough value. Because we need a relationship for us to be successful in selling, but our customers are not looking for more relationships. They want their time back, right? They yeah. want their time back to focus on the things that make a difference in their business. They want their time back to spend with their small inner circle of family and real friends. So the value is not in the relationship. It is for us because that's how we go make our sale. There is not enough value for them. So what are our insights? How do we adopt this consultative approach? Right, where we're helping them transform their business. And there's been lots of research done on what makes the biggest difference in retaining accounts, growing accounts, and winning competitive bids. 
And it's the degree to which the customer believes you are committed and part of them improving their results. That's what causes them to lean in. It's, it's not the friendliness that we offer or the entertainment. No. Oh, gosh. So, so many key points there. I love the team. Let's take away the, the point about the you'd, walk, you'd run off that plane so quickly when the airline pilot says, I'm not into technology. I had, I had a bit of an eye issue about a year ago. And when, wow. when I was going in to, to get it checked on with a one-year anniversary, I had a, a young technician uh, optometrist who, who'd come back from Burning Man. So he was young, cool dude. But the way he walked through the technology with me, comparing what, where my eye was today with where it was two years ago, why they were confident something else wasn't going to happen. The comfort I got, mostly because we weren't relying on his experience what they were actually were doing, they were punching into a database of X number of peop, thousand people who had been through this before. What's the likelihood of it happening again? So the technology went through and just, it, it aggregates all of the key insights from reams of data that his experience isn't good enough for. He, and he's fantastic. So that, that's really where we start to think of technology team. It's just, they're, they're, we're gonna get insights from just mounds of data that none of us can get through. And then when those insight, insights come to us, there might be trigger events that we can then leverage. And we can all learn technology. We all learned how to use Zoom overnight. Yeah. You know, do you remember how many years it was there where you couldn't even get somebody on LinkedIn Navigator because they just, they just weren't comfortable with technology. COVID hit and in six weeks, you and every customer you had, everybody out there, Everybody picked up Zoom, Skype, WebEx, whatever it was. We became pretty good at, tele at the video conferencing. Yeah, None of this is tough. You just have to be committed to it. Yeah, it's so, it's so true. It's so true. So, so let's talk about the essential technologies, right? So, so, so right at the very beginning is CRM, right? So again, most salespeople get into their CRM once a week just before the sales meeting to update the forecast, right? And the reality mm -hmm. is it needs to be our system of execution. Um, the thing that used to make my head explode as a CEO or as a sales leader is sales reps who would literally say, look, look, Tony, do you want me out there seeing customers and selling or do you want me filling in the CRM? Yeah. And I said, I said let, me, let me answer that question with another question. Imagine you're visiting your, your doctor and you had a problem, and they were diagnosing you, they did all of diagnosis, your, your blood pressure, they did all of these things, and then they prescribed a script for you, and they, and they said, we're done. And you said, but aren't, aren't you going to update your patient record system? And if they said, look, do you want me to diagnose you and prescribe something, or do you want me to fill in my patient <laughs> record system, right? <laughs> How do you feel? You, you would say, well, you're a professional doctor. I expect you to do both. How are you going to keep me safe and look after me if when I, when I come back, you don't have any records of what you've done with me in the past? Great analogy. Or what pressure was or my heart rate or my test results, my pathology results. So if you're a professional, you'll do both. It's like a pilot saying, hey, I love flying, but I'm not, I'm not into doing the logbook. Yeah. Well, you know, I love flying, but I don't like doing the pre-flight in the rain, you know, walking around, <laughs> checking the tires and the, and the engines. And the, <laughs> no, no, you're a professional. You do it all. So, so, it, it, so when you think of your tech stack, it all really begins with your CRM, which should include marketing automation, right? So maybe you've got two separate platforms. If you're a smaller business, maybe using something like HubSpot, you know, which has got marketing automation and, and CRM, uh, or maybe you've got Salesforce and Marketo, um, you know, so you've, you've got separate platforms, but, but CRM and marketing automation, so you've got a single source of truth, you're managing your whole sales process, you're capturing discovery in the system. And if you're a leader looking to implement CRM technology, 70% uh, of people fail and it's got nothing to do with the technology they pick. It's all to do with the way that they implement it. So there's a couple uh -huh. of key things you need to think about. First is, how does this enable good process? How does this enable process in a way that gives time back to my sellers? Oh, that is critically important. If you're not enabling a process in a way that gives time back to your sellers, they won't use it. You're not going to capture the data that you need. It's it's really, really critical. Right. So when you implement CRM, really think about that. The next piece of technology we all need to think about is um, 
network intelligence. So things like LinkedIn Sales Navigator, right? So um, think about the, the, the platforms that give you intelligence about your buyers. Buyers today expect us to, to know them before we've ever asked any questions because in their minds, so much about them is, is on the internet, right. Right? right? Information about their industry, their company, them in their role, them as an individual. Now, we don't want to get creepy, you know, by maybe stalking them in Facebook and saying, hey, uh, you know, the, the, the boating trip you did on the weekend with your little kids look great. Right. <laughs> right? That's, right. that's all really bad, right? But if we turn up and say, hey, ha how long have you been CFO here in the company? You're thinking, hang on, haven't you even done any research? Right. So, so things like LinkedIn Sales Navigator are, are really, really important, especially if you're selling into white collar organizations. Um, but there's, uh, there's about 800 million members of LinkedIn. Two people join a second. You know, it's just, it's just really essential. So, you know, that, that along with the basic technology of our, of our smartphone, you know, is really key. Um, but, that's, but that's really the foundation. Any questions or comments on those, Mark? Yeah, you know what? Um, one of the, I guess the comment would be, and we've got a couple of questions here, but all those make sense to me today, Tony, and, and the, you know, I love the, hey, we have an expectation you know us. And if you go back, I think you use a great reference in the book where you point to Cialdini, Robert Cialdini and the theory of reciprocity. So yes. when we do a little bit of that research and we find a quick way to share the point of interest and the research that says, I know you, it's in our DNA. I think the way you put it is that the theory of reciprocity says, I, I, I almost allow you to earn the right for the next part of the conversation yeah. because I'm flattered. And I want to be give you something back for what you've done for me. You reference, and his name escapes me, but you reference, you know, never ask for a withdrawal until you've made the deposit. So the deposit is the research and the value and the point yeah. of interest that I'm earning the right for the conversation, which I just love. Yeah. And, and the whole thing is show them that you know them. Show, show them that you've done some research. And then have a worthwhile point of view as the basis of the conversation, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's a really, really key. Um, we've, I mean, there's, there's, there's some good questions in here. Any of the questions that you'd like to focus on, Mark, that we're seeing I, in chat? I would, yes. So, so let's have a couple of, well, take a look at a couple of quick ones. Um, um, let me pull one. Okay. Here's a good one. Actually, is there, a, um, on a technology front, this is a very good question. Is there a platform or verbiage that that help us actually nail that story or narrative? So I know you've also used a very good story framework in the yeah. book. Is any technology platform or narrative out there today that uh, that helps with that, um, Tony? Well, if if we're thinking about creating the right narrative, the right conversation. What we know is it needs to be about how that person can drive improved results in their role, not about mm -hmm. us and what we do. And if we combine that with wanting to be relevant, the thing that's super powerful is trigger events. Now, there's a there's a fellow Canadian of yours that I'm friends with and I really respect him, Craig Elias, right? Okay. Who's, who's very big on trigger events. Uh, in in tech powered sales, I've got a whole section on trigger events that explains what they are, how to monitor for them. And let me tell you why trigger events are really important. It's really, there's really two reasons. Um, one is they provide strong contextualization for a relevant conversation. Yes. Um, and the other thing is it helps, it helps identify where there's higher propensity to buy. So in the very beginning of the book, I make the comment that the future of selling is where uh, buying intent meets seller relevance. Hmm. And the matchmaking is done by technology. So we, we know there's technologies out there that look for buyer intent. Thing, things like Sixth Sense and Bombora would be examples of two platforms. Right. And what they're doing, what they're doing is they're, they're sniffing at and finding people that are searching for things that indicate interest in buying what it is that you sell. Now, the problem with finding people using that technology is it's often a red ocean shark feeding frenzy Right. You and the competition all trying to get to the person. So in, in advance of that uh, buying intent signal technology, you want to think about trigger events. And I'll give you an example of this. A new 
C-suite person, a new senior executive into a role, is almost always hired by the CEO to affect change, right? They're hired to drive some level of change. And there'll typically be a five-month window where they're the golden child, the chosen one, and they'll get backed. If they go to the boss and say, hey, we need a new CRM. So let's say a new head of sales has come in. We need a new CRM in the business. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got, I've got no chance of holding people to account and driving good process without a good CRM. Oh, okay, let's go ahead and get one. Right. If that right. same person asked 18 months later for a CRM, <laughs> right, they're, they're now already a tired, broken person sitting around the boardroom table that doesn't deliver in the eyes right. of the CRM. Go, right right so new senior people into roles are high to effect change if you can monitor those role-based trigger events you know and as well as if you're selling in the mid-market let's say you're a tech company and you're selling to to scale up businesses your tech yes you think okay so if someone's done a series a series b capital raise typically what's happened is they're thinking we've bootstrapped their growth we've now raised some serious money it's time to get serious systems in behind to build a machine right uh, so you'd, you'd build a conversation narrative of, hey, hey, Mark, congratulations on the Series B capital raise. Um, look, I've actually got some ideas on how you can de-risk the really aggressive growth forecasts you've got with the new investors oh, involved. Um, when, 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 like, do, do you mind if I ask, where do you currently see the gaps, right? Uh, or where do you see the risks in actually delivering against the aggressive number right now? So... Your point of view is you can de-risk the aggressive growth targets that you now have, given you've done a big capital raise, right? So you're not talking about you and your tech, right? right. So, so, but what you're doing is you, you say, hey, congratulations on launching the, the Jabadoo product in, in, into Florida, you know? Hey, and also notice you just did your capital B, um, sorry, your series B capital raise. What you're doing there is you're, you're referencing a trigger event of a capital raise. You're, you're showing that you know them, that they're seeking to drive growth by expanding into other geographies with new product. The, the person will lean into the conversation. But the moment we say, hey, Mark, how are you today? You know, I know I you know. weren't expecting to get a cold call from another seller. Like the best it gets for us is about seven seconds before people think in their mind, I'm out of here. Right. Right. So we, we have to be relevant. So. There's technologies that can monitor for trigger events, right? So, and if you think about a thing like Sales Navigator, it'll identify role-based changes in an organization. Now, the problem with LinkedIn is people don't typically update, on average, their LinkedIn profile for six weeks till after they've joined. Interesting. So often it can be late. Often it can be late that, you, that you've noticed. But when you're doing your account management sessions with your clients, one of the questions you should always ask is, hey, what changes have occurred with people in the organization? Because a new person is an opportunity and a risk because a competitor yes. could follow this new person in and a new person is looking to drive change. They're looking for some quick wins in their role. Tony, we just came out of an account um, strategy session with, with one of our clients and the amount of change in that organization was staggering. Trying to build the, the relationship, the heat map was really tricky because there had been yeah. so many changes. You know, we talked about trigger events. One technology, the, the beauty of the book, by the way, team, is all the technologies that Tony's referencing along almost um, 25, 30 different segments, all the technologies are listed in the book. So trigger events, surprisingly, there's a technology out there called trigger that would help with trigger events. So, you know, yeah. some genius thought out that name. But, but obviously, you know, this is where the book comes in to be just this amazing guide. Given our time, Tony, I'm just going to keep a little bit of an eye on your time. One question I'll share from the group, then I've got my final question, and then we're going to let the team know how they actually get in contact with you. This one, I think, will prompt a very good conversation. It says, and thank you, Randy uh, Stackerak, for this one. The roles you've been describing as vulnerable to get illuminated uh, pertain to be the account management role. What about a new business focused sales role? The hunter focused salesperson, are they going to get eliminated as well? Interesting. I know you've got some comments there. I think one third of the field hunting roles are going to disappear. All selling has become inside sales as a result of COVID. And I don't think it's ever going to return back to the same levels of field selling. 
field sellers are, are hugely expensive and often highly inefficient, right? So the professional visitor lunch a lot model, I know I'm being really <laughs> harsh, really, really has no future. The, the field sellers of the future that will do well are the ones that are truly consultative, right? They've got genuine industry insights. They're truly consultative. And you say, well, I'm already operating at that level. I would say, great, you'll probably be okay. But you need to use technology well to increase your level of effectiveness is really yeah. the reality. So there'll be more inside sellers powered by ever-increasing tech stacks, you know, that are monitoring for the trigger events. They're automating a whole lot of research. Uh, be very careful automating outbound. There's a new category of tech called sales engagement platforms. Uh, things things like Outreach oh, IO, so sales high velocity selling in Salesforce. But automating spam will just damage you, right? So, so field sellers are okay if they're truly consultative, but if they're like a rep that just visits people, let me give you an update. Let me tell you about the latest thing. Hey, can I get you a discount? You know, everyone, everyone's figuring out there's not enough, va not enough value for buyer and seller for that to be sustainable. I think that's a challenge right now, frankly, Tony, with LinkedIn. It's becoming the world's biggest spam engine because uh, of, some of the, you know, some of these automated technologies. I won't name those companies because I think the technologies are great. They're just not being leveraged with any personalization. So it's, hey, the connection and right after the connection, it's the blind pitch. And suddenly, you know, suddenly now I've got somebody else who manages my LinkedIn profile. So, uh, yeah, you know, or, 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 or people are automating with stupid personalization. Yeah. Hey, Mark, I, no I noticed that we both live in Canada. Would it make sense to talk? <laughs> really? Is yeah. That, is that the, right? yeah. 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 Boy, so they, what a connection. Me and the other 30 million people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, hey, Tony, I know I haven't left enough time for this question, but, you know, one of the things I think in terms of your predictions for the roaring 20s, the 2020s, was this evolution of the sales manager into almost this rev ops role. Yeah. So, you know, in, in just a couple of minutes, tell me a little bit about what you say in sales management today, because our belief is it's actually sales management that's kind of the X factor of professional sales today. When we look at some of the challenges and all those metrics not going the way we want, unfortunately, a lot of the time the trigger is the sales leader because they've got three stakeholders that are incredibly demanding. You know, customers, which are so important, their CEOs and executive teams, and they've got the sales team. They're pulled in lots of different directions. How, how are they kind of leveraging technology or where do you see that role going so that they can be more effective? Sales management is without doubt the toughest role in any organization. Sadly, for most companies, sales management is the weak link in the revenue chain. And it's not always the fault of the sales manager themselves. They're spread incredibly thin. They have many more people. Their span of control you know, is becoming broader. Uh, and, the, and the real goal, the, the magic in the role of sales manager is in coaching people. Or is, in, is in coaching people and they, they just don't have the bandwidth to do it. There's so much manage up. So the, the reality is, is we all need to become a little cyborg. We, we need to become human and technology all fused together. And the whole idea of this, of this RevOps role is it, it just recognizes that so much of an organization and of individual salespeople's success today is dependent on the effective use of technology. Right. So the idea is, you know, a fair while ago now, people talked about this chief revenue officer role, which worked in maybe a few places, but largely failed everywhere else. But the notion of trying to bring together sales and marketing effectively is really important. I still see massive, massive disconnects between sales and marketing organizations today. It's, it's hopeless. So the idea of RevOps is you're trying to bring together sales and marketing with people and technology to equip and also effectively enable people to be far more effective. So if you think about, we need to target our people into the ideal customer profile. We need to give them a list of accounts that match. Well, technology can really help with that, right? We, we then need to source mobile phone numbers and email addresses and, and some contextualized personalization data for them to build the conversations. Technology can do a lot of that. Right, so we, we need to we need to help sellers become effective micro marketers. Technology yeah. can help them do those things. So the the whole idea of RevOps is to bring those two things together. 
Well, you know, beautifully said on every point. And team, I'm just going to I'm going to remind everybody today, you know, if we want to take our careers to the next level, we have to take control of our careers. Um, this is a spectacular guide to get you there. And so, um, you know, go to Amazon today. Let's get this book today. By the way, you'll also want to pop on to Top Sales World because right now the book is receiving such accolades that Tony's, Tony and Justin have been nominated for Book of the Year with Top Sales World magazine. So have a read. You'll enjoy it as much as I did and give them that nomination. Hey, Tony, after today, when these folks want to get in contact with you, learn more, understand what you do, either on a consulting side or with Sales IQ, how, how do they get in contact with you? Yeah, Mark, Mark the, the reality is you're an awesome consultant. So if they need help, they, they, should, they should go ahead and just talk to you. Oh, thank I'm you. Completely, I'm completely maxed out with all of my consultant, uh, with all my consulting clients, but I do do keynote speaking. So if you're looking for a speaker for your 2022 sales kickoff, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, if you're looking to enable your team with these concepts, uh, especially on learning about um, com combo prospecting, salesiqglobal.com. So salesiqglobal.com is where we've got e-learning around this. And there's lots of free content from me at tonyhughes.com.au, tonyhughes.com.au. Uh, webinars, podcasts, videos, a um, whole lot of free IP that I just give away. But I really encourage you as a leader, get your people reading and then, you know, organize a book club within your, your organization, run a meeting once a month where you have a discussion designed to hold people to account for checking they actually read the book and what are they thinking they'll implement to change results. Um, you know, I've got lots of great content on my website, you know, have to get, get them to listen to a podcast or a webinar or an interview and then say to them at the sales meeting, what are the things you took away? You know, what is it you disagree with? What... What's the one thing we could do differently that would move the needle? Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. So, so team, just so you know, those of you on the live webinar today, my amazing teammate, Neil, is going to capture those links for Tony, and that'll be in the follow-up email you received today. So, so do take that away so you can grab onto those sites. Uh, Tony, on behalf of the entire community here, I just want to say a very sincere thank you very much for making time for us today. What a great discussion. And I hope we can have you back on the show in the future. Thanks, Mark. And everyone will love the conversation with Justin Michael. He's incredible. Awesome. You take care, Tony. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. We'll see you next week.